Do I? 
end. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're the divine. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I am by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're good, you're fine. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am.
purify you and to sanctify you because as it says in my word I will not only shake the heaven but I'll shake the earth and he said there is a great shaking coming but if you've given me the fullness of you and the fullness of me dwells within you there will be nothing within you to be shaken and you will go through this time of shaking Stand and firm, sure-footed as you watch the world get shaken to pieces around you. So I tell you, hearken those words and take them to heart which I have said to you this day. Get the fullness of me so I can carry you through this time of shaking and you'll look to the left of you and you'll look to the right of you and thousands upon thousands will be falling and shaking but you will not be touched. Oh, Loma Shiani I say, hearken unto what the Lord has said and what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. What a promise. What a promise in the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. No, Loma Shiani Tashi. Hallelujah. There is none like Him. Amen. Amen. The Word of God says a thousand to fall at one side, ten thousand at the other side. But it ain't touching me. Amen? Oh, Say, well, I didn't read it that way. That's Mike's translation. <laughs> right on, Mike. You may not want to read my translation, but there's some ain'ts in there. There's some double, double negatives in there. <laughs> I don't see anything wrong with double negatives. Yes. Pastor Greg, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Amen. Amen. Just do a little housekeeping peeping up here. We've got all kinds of things up here. Ooh, my goodness. <laughs> the water's fresh. The water's fresh. You got it. Yours. Have you been to New Orleans recently? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm going to put these over here. This is the day the Lord has made. Amen. 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 Okay, we can rejoice, be glad in it. Amen. Now I got one more thing. Hold on. I guess I could have done some of this ahead of time. You know what today is? You may know what today is? Communion Sunday. They looked a little different. I've always said, and I've said this before here, and I'll always say it again, it's probably one of my favorite times of services. When I pastored for 12 years, we did this as often as you ought to in remembrance of me. Kind of like you all do it here, first Sunday of every Sunday month for 12 years. Every month, beginning of the month, we had a communion message. Now, as a pastor, that can be a little bit trying to do a communion message for 12 years every month. That's 12, that's 144 messages, right? Not including Christmas, Easter, when you usually do communion as well. To me, communion, and it, it, the Word of God is real explicit. It's how, I, whenever you do this, do it as often as it remembers to me. It's how you ever want to do it. It's the way you want to do it. I'm just telling you how I did it. I wanted that service to be about communion. Yes. Amen? Amen? Because I find that the communion and the elements on the table are very important in our lives. Because He did this, and He asked us to do this, not out of tradition or out of obligation, 
But it's kind of like, what's, what, even in your household, what meal is where now we are living in a different society, things are a little weird, out of balance, but generally speaking, what's the meal that everyone gathers around at least somewhere in the house? Supper. Even the heathens have supper. It's God set up to commune with our Father. And so communion is not just a tradition, a religious thing we do. This should be a lifestyle. Because he said, he set him down in a room and he said, as often you should do this, do this in remembrance of me. He's saying, guys, this is important. Amen? It's important. Look over in John chapter something. <laughs> One step ahead of my, my mouth is one step ahead of my fingers. Look over at John chapter 3, verse number 14 is where we're going to begin. John chapter 3 and verse number 14. I like the lights like this. Don't you all? No, I like it. You can see me and I can't see you frowning at me. <laughs> I like this atmosphere. I don't know. Praise God. Amen. You over in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to talk about communion. Over in John chapter 3. Hallelujah. John chapter 3. Verse number 14. Now this is, a very, I mean, everyone knows John 3.16. but And it says, As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Amen. Communion reminds us every time we take of this table, every time we gather together as family, and we look to this table, this table reminds us that my God loves me. My God loves me unconditionally. My God loves me not because of my faults, but He overlooks my faults. My God loves me when no one else ever will love you. I mean, everyone is in here at some point in time in life. You've sat on your chair, you sit in the couch, you sit on your, in your car, and think, does not anybody love me? My God always loves me. He loves me so much that He placed a worth on me greater than His only Son. That's how much my God loves me. God loves you the same way. This table always will remind me how much of a sacrifice my God had to give to have a relationship with me. He gave His only begotten Son so that He could have fellowship with me. There's been no greater love that's ever been shown than the love that my Father has shown me because He placed me at a more important position than He placed His own Son. He allowed His Son to be sacrificed on a cross, so simply that he could commune and have supper today with me. <clears throat> My God, he loves me. My God, he loves you. Such an unconditional, unjudgmental love. Now, a lot like some of you all, there's been things I've done in my life that I'm not real proud of. There have been ugly moments in my life. Anyone else? In the midst of my most, most un, ugliest moment that I've ever had in my entire 55 years, my God loved me just as much then 
as he does right now, his love doesn't change. This is what this represents. I kind of put it on a chair. This is kind of a centerpiece. When I sit down and we have communion, it's not a, to me it's not something we tack on and it's not talked about too much. And it's, This is a glorious time. When I do this, it brings back the life of the fact my God loves me no matter what. When no one else will. When everyone else thinks I'm unlovable. I'm lovely. I can look up and I can see Him. And I know He looks down and says, I love you. Yeah, Wraps His arms around me. There's just a warmth about it. Yeah. As you know, when you sit down with family and you're having a good dinner and everyone's talking, there's a warm, fuzzy feeling. Yeah. I get that on communion. You know, some, some time I've been in communion services it felt like a funeral. It's not. This is a supper of celebration. Yes, sir. Why? My God loves me. Yeah. He, you know, there's a scripture that says He prepared a table of plenty in front of my enemies, showing His goodness. God's all about food. Amen. <laughs> it doesn't matter what others think of you. You're worth something. God loves you. Some of us in here this morning just need to remind yourself sometimes. You may have been in church for the last 40 years, but sometimes you've got to shake yourself and remember God loves you. Amen. Unconditionally. You can't read enough. You can't study enough. You can't be in enough seminaries. You can't pray enough. You can't do any. God simply loves you. For who you are and what you are. Amen. Amen. God loves you. Secondly, when I'm sitting down and we're looking at the Lord's table, it reminds me of what He did for me, Jesus. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Well, what's remembrance of me? Everything Jesus has done for me. A lot of people don't realize. Now, when I was a young man getting ready to be, the Lord was working on my heart and calling me into the ministry starting at the age of about 16 or 17. Uh, I had a routine, and we won't go into great detail, but I was a famous Reader's Digest reader. I was the one at the house that would get it out of the mailbox. I would proceed to take it to a certain room in the house that we won't go into. <laughs> and I would sit there until my legs would go numb and I couldn't get up off and it would be laughter the best medicine, humor and uniform, the main theme story. I mean, I just went through that thing. As a young kid, I mean, I maybe I was even 15. I'll never forget the day, though, that I took a Bible into the same place. It's honorable. There's a throne there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I tried to read this. And I, and I go in there and, and it got to the back fact that I would go in there and, and read as a child not knowing anything. As best as I could. Not knowing there was an Old Testament, there was a New Testament, that that meant something. <coughs> Here's what sat. I even went into a new, kind of a, a charismatic church. It was a pastor. He'd actually graduated from Rama, believe it or not. I went there for a short time, and, and, and God just called me, go to school, go to Rama. 18 years old, packed my car up, and I headed to Rama. Never been out of my mama's house ever before. Not been out of the state of Ohio. I mean, I just packed up, let's go. Worked out. Got the greatest revelation when I first got first class was taught by Dean Moffat, which was he was like everybody was afraid of Dean Moffat. <laughs> he was I shouldn't say dictator, but boy, I tell you what, scared you. I came in class one time and I never forgot. Someone come up and tap me on the shoulder. Now they've changed some regulations from that then now. 
of Dean Moffat. He goes, I'm like, oh, no. I go out and he says, you can continue to, for this, this day, but you'll have your hair cut to the proper length before you come back to school. Dang, <laughs> it touched my collar. <laughs> and I never forget the first class I had was called Life of Christ and Dean Muffet was the teacher. And he uttered this most amazing revelation that I'd never heard of before. I mean, here I am in Bible school in the first week my eyes are opened. Did you all know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the same story told by different authors? <laughs> had a kid of 18 years old that had been to a word church. That was never said to me before. And I just sat there going, oh. <laughs> now it makes sense. People say, what's your biggest revelation when you went to Bible school? Ta-da. You say, you're kidding me. No, because it changed my whole perspective. But this table tells me something else today. The story was about Jesus through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But you know, as I got older and got more into ministry, hey, this guy named Jesus, that said as often you should do this, that loves me so much he gave up his own life for me, he is in all of this. Very beginning. In Genesis. Let us make man in our image. That's Jesus. Jesus the Word produced. So when I get to communion, this reminds me of what Jesus did for me, not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but in Genesis through Revelations, it makes me to remember everything Jesus did for me. I've got a little thing here. Jesus is in every book of the Bible. When I sit down, now I don't know, at our, our dinner table, I can't go, go into some of the conversations that would go on. But when I sit down at this table, these are the things that I remember. What did He do for me? See, you can't have faith for the future or faith for the present if you don't accept what He did for you in the past. Amen? Amen? In Genesis, Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, He is the Passover lamb. In Le Le they got to pray for me. Leviticus, He's our high priest. In Numbers, He is the pillar of the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, He's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, He's the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, He's the judge and law lawgiver. In Ruth, He's our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's a seed of David. Kings and Chronicle, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he is our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he is the rebuilder of everything broken. Glory to God. Yes. In Esther, he is our advocate. In Job, he is our ever living redeemer. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastic, he's a meaning for life. In the Song of Solomon, he's the loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the Prince of Peace. Jeremiah and Lamentations, he's our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, the glorious, the glorious Lord. In Daniel, he's the fourth man. Oh, yeah, this is my yes, favorite Lord. one. He's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is a faithful husband. In Joel, he's the outpour of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's our judge and savior. In Jonah, he's our risen prophet. In, in Micah, he is the rule of the world from Bethlehem. In Nahum, he is the stronghold. In Habakkuk, he is the watchman. In Zephaniah, he is the mighty to see. In Haggai, he is the restorer. In Zechariah, he is the branch of David, the one pierced for us. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness. In Matthew, he's the king of the Jews, the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. In Mark, he is a servant, miracle worker. In Luke, he is a baby in the manger, the son of man. In John, he is the son of God, the living word, the way, the truth, the life. In Acts, he is the savior of the world, ascending, ascending Lord. In Roman, he is the justifier. In 1 Corinthians, he is the resurrection. In 2 Corinthians, he is our comfort. 
Galatians, he's our liberty. Ephesians, he's the head of the church. And Philippians, he's our joy. And Colossians, he's our completeness and the glue that holds the world together. And first and second Thessalonians, he's the coming king. And first and second Peter Peter. And first and second Timothy. He is a meditator. And Philemon, he is our benefactor. And Titus, he's our blessed hope. And Hebrew, he's our perfection. And James, he is the power behind our faith. And first and second Peter, he's our chief uh, shepherd, chief cornerstone. In Jude, he's the foundation of our faith, our security. And in Revelations, he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. I'll tell you what, when I sit down at communion, it reminds me of everything Jesus did, not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but everything from Genesis to Revelations. It can become story time. Because when you start reading about these things that, that I just read about, there's an excitement that builds. Like I said, so communion, not to me, is never a solemn time. And I don't mean it bad, but like a funeral. It's a it's a good dinner. It's like Thanksgiving with the family. When you all get together and the pumpkin pie comes out and, and, and that gravy that Grandma makes and, and those deviled <laughs> eggs and that turkey that's sitting on there and you all get together and you can't hear nothing from everyone talking. That's what communion is. Like I said, you have your own communion. That's what it is to me. We're reminiscent. I learn more about my family during Thanksgiving dinners than any other time of anything. Because everyone just talked about it. I tell you what, we got to change our idea about communion. As often as you do this, it's a, He loves me. And He wants me to remember all the things that He did here on earth. Not just as a man, but from Genesis to Revelations. Amen? Amen. Oh, our God, such a good God. We can see different scriptures here. I'm not going to go into all of them, but this here table. I mean, nowadays we went. I've probably never seen these. These are amazing. They are. Has anybody spilled the juice out first? Crackers on one side. I guess you got to get that off before you take the other one off. Yeah. This is going to need directions for me because I can see me taking the cracker off and then, or taking the juice off and then trying to get the cracker. Because you take the body for anyway. When we take this today, these are just objects. It's just a little bit of. Grape juice, a little, really, piece of styrofoam. <laughs> okay, I know it's unleavened, but it's styrofoam. And we look at that, and I think sometimes we get a little, <coughs> we don't understand sometimes how important this is. In fact, in the scripture in Corinthians, when he's talking about it, he says not to do it in an unworthy manner. Because many have died or many are asleep because they did it unworthily. It's not just a little bit of juice and crap. This is serious stuff. This says you, you need to get yourself right. It's not hard. It's simply before you take communion, you say, Lord, if there's any that forgiveness in my heart, if there's any sins that I'm not thinking about it, I haven't forget. If I if I have ought against my neighbor. Lord, I'm asking you right now to cover me in the blood of Jesus from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Wipe me clean. Just like a whiteboard eraser. Just whoo, whoo. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Now you're worthy. Well, what this does, because we use items, well, Jesus suggested it, so it's good. We use inanimate items that are so small and insignificant, and insignificant I think we forget that only know we know that God loves us and we know that Jesus was all throughout the Bible and we're supposed to remember what for He did. Do you understand He's still working today? Amen. That's right. Jesus is alive and well. Jesus is in our midst right now. He's the one. He's still out activated. He's still operating. Amen? Yeah. Oh, we know over in Hebrews He says He's the same yesterday and today and forever and that He will never leave us 
or nor forsake us. Jesus will never leave you. He is here taking care of you right now. Our Father God never sleeps. He never slumbers. He said that Jesus sits at His right hand making intercession for you and for you and for you 24-7. He's a working mighty force. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. Amen? Amen. See, communion's exciting. When I sat down and I pulled this out, um, Jesus is alive. He's right now. He's right there with the Father God talking about me. Not in a bad way. Not in a church way. <laughs> Amen. Amen. In a good way. He's saying, Dad, look at what they're doing. Dad, hey, he may need this. Dad, hey, look at my blood. And I know he's being, a, he's being a screw up right now. But my blood is all over him. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Amen. This is a big deal. Amen. He, 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 he's working mightily. You know, over in 1 Peter 2.24, by His stripes, we were already healed. Amen? Sickness and disease has no place upon me. In fact, part of the, the communion is when you break His, the bread represents His body. And you break it. Why do you break it? Because His body was breaking, breaking, broken and bruised. <laughs> Amen? His hands were pierced so that we could have health and hold it in our body. So when I look at communion, He's still working today. If I get up and I have a runny nose, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus, our stripes were laid upon His back. Heal me now. Amen? I've heard different evangelists and different people talk about warehouses of parts in heaven. It's like a Napa for, for you. <laughs> There is a Napa warehouse in heaven with my name on it that has my parts and pieces that I need when I need them. And if he wasn't alive and working today, I couldn't get those parts because there's no one working the parts counter. And he's never out of stock. Y'all, I don't know if you all, the way everything is now, to get anything, it's out of stock. You're going to have to wait. Thank God, my God, who's alive today, doesn't work that way. Amen. When I go to the parts counter and I raise my hand, he goes back, grabs what I need, and hands it to me. Yes. Amen. Amen? My God has no lack. Amen. Glory to God. Over in John 10, 29, and over in even Luke, it talks about He's a God. He's protecting me. He says that, I am placed in the palm of His hand and no man can pluck Him from His palm. Amen? That's a daily thing. You know, in your Ukraine, you, you, there's some Christian brothers and sisters over there. And, and I'm telling you, you get a hold of the Word. And, and I'm not saying... You know, they can be in the palm of His hand. See, you, the Word says it's for Him. Amen? And if you don't have the Word, that's not a good place to be. But it says, in His hand, you are there and no man can pluck you out. That's pretty protected. That's a living God that's acting right now. Amen? I've told you all before, and if you all know where one of it is, let me know, but I'm still trying to get one of my very first cards I've ever had. A 1974 Vega GT. I'm like, ooh, yeah. No, not a Firebird, not a Charger, not a Trans Am. I want a 74 Vega GT. I'm weird. I'm strange. I want it blue. I want the white stripes. I'm having a harder and harder time to see if there are any other. I want original. But everyone's taking them and stripping them and making them into these monster things that I don't want. I'll never forget coming out. I was, I, I was out in the country coming back as a young man, not doing what I was supposed to do, not driving the speed limit, well over 70. I'll never forget hitting a patch of ice. Come around the corner. We're talking 12, 30 at night. Hit that patch of ice. And everything suddenly went into slow motion as my 1974 Vega GT started doing 360s down the highway. 
And I remember looking out as a young man, probably 17, this is before I, I went to Bible school, so the devil would work in overtime with my stupidity. Never looking out the window in the back of the GT, and all I see is nothing, because it was a cliff. It's not a cliff, a hill, an embankment, trees. I saw trees. And I remember all I did is turn around, and as a young man, I'd been taught enough, even though I didn't know Matthew, Luke, Mark, all were the same story, I was told about the name of Jesus in that church. And I didn't, all I had time to say, in the name of Jesus, protect me, Lord. All of a sudden, sky, ground, sky, ground. <laughs> I ended up on the side of the hillside. The driver's door was against the ground. To get out, I had to climb out the other side. I don't know if you may have experienced this. It's not comforting. And I got out, climbed off. Some guy's running out of his house that I had just wrecked in his front yard. He goes, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, all I heard was screaming and squealing and all of a sudden a crash and everything. I said, well, I don't want to leave this in your front yard. Help me push it over. He goes, what? I go, well, I think I can drive it off the hill. Pushed it over. Went to start it, nothing. Dang. Climbed up the hill. My battery for the car was what's still on the highway about, you know, 100 yards down. When I was spinning it, the reason I looked for it is because the battery wasn't strapped in. So I got the battery put in the car. Short, short, short no, story up. Drove it off the side and went drove it home. Got home, then I freaked out. I had my mom take me back the next day. Because well, I didn't drive for a week after that. <laughs> so it was a little harrowing experience that I didn't realize until I got home. And she, I walked in, my, go, my mom was like, Oh my Lord, what happened to you? Your hair, I had hair, stands up. And he, she goes, You're white as a ghost. <laughs> well, then it hit me. Oh my gosh. I just put my car and totaled it. But no, I didn't total I actually drove it for another four months in high school. It looked like every hip, <laughs> sides, roof, back, all wrecked. So she took me back the next day. We pulled off into the guy's driveway and she goes, Son, I can't believe you're here. And I went over there and we got out and walked over there. And you can see the, actually skid marks that you do 360s look kind of nice, neat on the highway. You know, they're decorative. And then you can see where my 1974 Vega GT, if anyone out there has one, went off like this. Literally, two trees this big that you couldn't have fit it in straight ways. The only way is somehow to get it in their angle. That thing, you can see it through the grass, had slid backwards, diagonally, at an angle between two trees, before it gently rolled down the hillside and landed on the passenger door. I was doing well over 70. You say, well, how do you, I don't know because the speedometer stopped at 85. And it was just going like this. I looked at my mom and I did, like I said, I was new to this stuff. You know, when you're new to it, you do a lot of things and actually it works. And then when you get older, you get too smart about spiritual things and you <laughs> don't get to work them anymore. She said, what happened? I said, well, you see right up here when it starts to go off the road. I said, that's when I looked out the back window. I saw trees and I said, in the name of Jesus, protect me. That's what, this table means a lot to me. This, this table, what he did, what he represented, it saved my physical life more than I like to admit. Because I'm, I was silly, stupid. As a teenager. Uh -huh. I can't believe I'm standing here for the things I did. A 1974 Vega, if you hit a bridge at a well over 100 miles an hour, it flies better than any car out there. I used to go and fly my car. Hit the bridge. 
and then go back and see where the oil pan hit the ground to determine how far I got that time. I found out that in 1979, Plymouth Horizon doesn't fly. It nose dives. First time I took my mom's car, I tore the bumper clean off the front of it. Because it didn't fly like the Vega. It just went, <clears throat> didn't work. <laughs> my God, this communion table reminds me God provides healing. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. In Philippians 4 9, He's the provider of all my needs. When I take communion, I understand my bank account don't matter. What I got don't matter. This is the kingdom. Anything I ever need, this is where it provided for me. Philippians 4 7, He says He gives me peace that surpasses understanding. What that simply means is when we're part of a situation or circumstance where you should be nuts and crazy and losing your mind, you could stand there with God's peace all over you. In the most trialing time, you can just stand there and smile. People will say, what's wrong? They must have lost it. No. God's peace surpasses understanding. You, you're able to understand it. The Bible says so. Amen? In Nehemiah 8.10, it says it talks about the joy. It says, joy unspeakable, full of glory. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. That's why I said this is not a solemn. This is like a birthday celebration. A graduation party. I didn't have a lot of parties. A birthday party. Everyone's joy. This is joyful dinner. Amen. This is family. We all love one another. We should. Amen. Reminds me what Jesus did for me through the entire Bible. Let's me know He's alive today. And now so He's going to come back. Amen. Amen. He's coming back. Back over when He's talking about the communion part. You do this into the, basically until the day I return. There's so many scriptures in the Word that basically say, keep this up. Keep your faith up. I'm coming back. I'm coming again. I'm coming back. Amen? Amen. You know, you get all freaked out about what's going on around in the society right now and everything that's going on in the news and Ukraine, which is a horrible situation. More horrible that the world's basically standing back and not doing anything about it. But... The Bible says this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. The Bible says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. It says there's going to be uh, shaking and under, there's going to be pestilence. I don't know about you all, but everything in the last two years, including what we're seeing on the news right now, the Lord's told us that. The Lord said that in Matthew. He said that. What do we know? What do we expect at the end times when the Lord comes back to take the church out of here? It's what you're seeing, Amen. Yeah. It could be tomorrow. It could be even fifty years. Don't know, but I do know everything we're seeing and hearing has been unprecedented for years, and because of the internet, everyone knows. When is? Whenever in history. Can you see another country battle in another country just like you're watching a sitcom? I'm telling you what. It's getting close. And when I sit down at this table and I sup with my God, He's saying it ain't going to be much longer, but it's going to be me and you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yes, amen. amen? It's got... I may not be there... In person, but soon you will be with me. Because why? I'm going to come get you. And I'm going to bring you to the real meal that I'm, you're expecting. Why? Because he's going to say, I want to hear this. You've done well, my good and faithful servant. Yes, Amen? Amen? That's what I want. I see communion somewhat differently than some people. Communion excites me. I love having the opportunity to take of the elements. It means something to me. 
something great and something mighty. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You get anything out of that? Yes. Hallelujah. Well, at this time, Pastor Greg, he's going to lead us. And we're, the worship team, if they want to get ready, they've got a song. We're going to do what the Word of God says to do over in 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to take communion together. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Pastor Greg. That was a good word. Amen. Church, you don't realize how blessed we are. Amen. When I was in fifth grade, my mom sent me to live with my grandmother and grandfather in between Kelso and New Hamburg. And I went for the half of my fifth grade year to Kelso C7 New Hamburg School. It wasn't anything new. I ended up going to six different elementary schools, three different junior high schools, and one high school. So if you wonder why I'm a little brain damaged, that's part of it. But the first day there, the uh, it used to be a Catholic school that they that they made into uh, just a public school, but they always had mass at eight o'clock. And the first day of school there, I was the new kid, and 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 the Catholic boys invited me to go to mass. To which I said, sure. And they went through Mass, and, you know, the, the, if you've ever been in a Catholic church, they had the dealing rails, and, you know, boom, shang, boom, shang, you know, every time. And you'd read from the little book. And it came time for communion. And like, just not knowing what to do and just trying to follow along, I went up with them. Now, I had no idea what you were supposed to say. I had no idea what you were supposed to do. But I, I was listening real close. And uh, when it got to my turn, he said, the body of Christ, and I said, amen, and they gave me the little cracker, and I ate it, or he placed it in my mouth or something. Well, that night, when I got home from school, I told my grandma what I had done, and she made fun of me. Because, see, what I didn't realize was I was supposed to be Catholic in order to do that. And every now and then, my, you could ask my wife, my grandma would bring that up. You remember that time you went up to communion at the Catholic church in school? There wasn't any freedom. The next time I really got familiar with communion was after I got saved. I mean, we're really saved. On November 1st, 1990, we'd been going to the Old Baptist Church for a couple years. And I mean, I could go into a long detail. But one time, Pastor Lee decided to do communion a little bit different. And basically what he had us do was to walk up and get communion. And I never heard so many complaints in my life. Well, this is Catholic. And they had forgotten the freedom that communion brings. <coughs> wow. And now here I am, <coughs> the Father's Arms Fellowship some over 20 years later. And I noticed this morning <coughs> and I thought about since Kim and I come here <coughs> there's freedom here. 
freedom to be who you have been called to be and the freedom who you want to be. And I was listening to Mike's message. Awesome message, brother. Awesome. And I've always, I agree with him. I've always thought this is to be a celebration, not a part of the service. Amen. I can remember pastoring, and I'm not busting chops on Baptists. I mean, listen, I'm, if it went for the Baptists, I wouldn't be saved. But it became so routine and just a part of the program. That if you broke protocol, people got so bent out of shape over the protocol that they totally missed what this meal is all about. It's not freedom. Freedom in Jesus. Freedom for the fact that you know now that you're not going to hell because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed on your behalf and that you believed it. And the, and the fact of the matter is he knew and was, was going to work on you before the very beginning of time as we know it, that you were going to be saved. He chose you and he has predestined you for this very moment. Now, it's, it gets a little bit deeper than that. Yeah. But because of what Christ did for you, you have freedom. I noticed this morning that, and, and I love the fact that Pastor Ken allows us the freedom to be who we want to be. We had two sermons this morning. Amen. And nobody cared. I'm serious. No one cared. I didn't see anybody looking at their watch. I didn't see anybody getting a little bit fidgety. I didn't see anybody freaking out because protocol got broke. Why? 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 The praise team didn't start playing music until 25 till 11. <laughs> oh my gosh. We, it was 20 minutes of church. It didn't matter. Because we have freedom. And this morning, Brother Larry and Sister Kathy is going to come up and they are going to serve communion. And you are going to have the freedom to confess your faults before the Father and just to walk up and grab communion and sit back down and at your leisure commune with the Father with joy that unspeakable. Because I agree, this is a joyous time. He gave us a physical reminder of His death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. And all that He asks of us is just do this as often as we do in remembrance of Him. He just wants us to remember what He did for us. That's it. There's no deep theological semblance in this that I can tell. Some people will try to make it that, but no. It's an opportunity to commune with God with joy and peace because the fact of the matter is by His stripes and His blood you have been saved and healed miraculously. Every one of you is a miracle because God knew who you were beforehand and He loved you anyway. And so the Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you, that the Lord Yeshua, on the night he was betrayed, took matzah, where he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in memory of me. And I love this next verse in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I always add, as family. Amen. You know, we are, we are a group of different people in this place. But we're still family. Amen. 
Amen. You know, you can call me, you know, almost sarcastic. That's okay. It just, it'll just give me incentive to keep working at it. But we're family. And together we're proclaiming with joy the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're doing it with joy and just a great, awesome time together as family. Amen. So the Sadler's going to come up. You guys go ahead and come up. And the praise team is going to play. Once you do the elements at your leisure, then you're dismissed. Now, the night that Jesus did it, they did sing a song, and then they went headed towards the Garden of Gethsemane. But in this day of your freedom, sing your own song to Jesus on your way out. Just praise Him. Yes. And they may try to take they may try to take Jesus away. But guess what? He's in there and they can't take it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hand. I'm hoping that I wake up until I lay my head. I will see a look in the gym of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so The goodness of God. Your goodness is running out. 